Today we're talking about time. As the sands through an hourglass, so are the days of our lives. November 8, 1965. A picture of an hourglass came on screen with sand going through it. And a TV show was born. A soap opera called Days of Our Lives. And you know what I think? I think short of eternity, the only thing that's going to ever last longer is that stupid TV show. <laughs> it's been here since 1965. They just renewed it for another season. But I look at this. And I think there's some wisdom to that, isn't there? As the sands through an hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Our lives are short. I've always been fascinated with hourglasses. I particularly like this one. Doris Kelly got this for me, and it's a Bronco orange, so I am very happy with that. But I've always been fascinated with hourglasses. Even when I was a little kid, I was fascinated with them. And I would sit there, and for hours, I would watch that sand go through that hourglass. And it's really, really cool. And you can take all the time you want to to be able to do that. And that is a really good thing. Except for when you take all of your life to look at the sand going through the hourglass. And then that's all you've ever done with your life is watch the sand go through the hourglass. This is how many of us live our entire lives whether it be through TV, whether it be on a phone, whether it be going to movies, whether it be taking vacations, whether it be working to get more money so I can get more stuff, I watch my life slip from top to bottom like the sands through an hourglass. What a tragic epitaph for people who live their lives like that. Because that's certainly not how Christ wants us to live our lives. But our days are numbered, aren't they? We only have a certain number of days in our lives and then it's completely over. We're gone. It's done. And here's the thing. What you've spent, you can't get back. Watching the sand going through that hourglass, I'll never get back. There's no way I can ever build on that. There's no way I can ever do anything different. Once that time is gone, that time is gone. And here's the thing, it's okay to do that, but it's just not useful when my whole life becomes unuseful as a result of that. See, we all have 24 hours a day. We all have seven days a week. We all have 168 hours a week. Okay? Okay? We can't get any of that back. We can't ask for more. We can't even say, okay, well, I'm going to put it for next month. I'm going to put this into next month like your, your, your plan is for your telephone. You can't do that. Once it's gone, it is gone, and you will never get it back. So what do you do with your time? That becomes the question. What do you do with your time? Because time is a hugely precious commodity. How many of you ever played Boggle? A few people. Boggle is such an awesome game. It's this little container and it's got dice that have letters on it. And you shake it up and you put all the letters, settle wherever they're going to settle. And then it has with it an hourglass. And you turn the hourglass over and then you've got two minutes or whatever it is to write words. So you make up words based on, based on what the letters are that are in this little, little box. And whoever gets the most words wins. Now, here's the problem. If you're a person that gets anxious easily, you're writing down and you're seeing other people and they're writing, words. and I got the word and. and oh, I got the word of. And these people are writing supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and they're writing all of these words, right? And then what do you start doing? You start looking at the hourglass. And then pretty soon you're looking at it. And then your mind freezes, and then you can't think of any words. And then the sand goes through that hourglass, and you lose the game. Folks, that is a lot like our lives. We just live our lives. And we don't think of consequences. We don't think of effect. We don't think of God's call on our lives. 
And then somewhere along the line, we get a wake-up call and we begin to realize that the sand is slipping through our hourglass. And so then we panic trying to do something good or something right. There are whole movies made about this kind of principle. But it is a precious commodity. Time is a totally precious commodity. You know, the Greeks understood this. They actually had two words. The Greeks had two words for time. First, there's chronos time. And chronos is second by second, what my watch says, day by day, chronological time. It's time past, time present, time future. It's time. But then there's also another kind of time, and it's called kairos time. So we all live in chronos time. We go from one minute to the next minute to the next minute. We do things during all of this period of time, whether it's seemingly nothing or whether it's a lot of things. But we go through time. We literally live in time together. But during those times, there are these moments of our lives where kairos time should happen. That's those moments of life, the opportune time. That's kairos time. That's that moment that you can grab onto. It's that minute where you realize something and you step into action about it. It's that opportune time to be able to do it. So there's these two different things. Now you can live your entire chronos time, chronological time, and never have a kairos moment. You can never have a moment where God speaks to you and steps you out from where you're at and says, I have this call on your life. Make the most of it. Now's the time. Now's the time. Do something about it now. There's many times we just don't do anything about it. And in those seven days a week, the resources that we have with those seven days a week are very important to God. So the key question for the day is, how do I best use my time to serve God and others? Now, the Bible teaches many passages. Really, it does about time. But the key verse for today is really helpful for reminding us of this, that our lives after we become a follower of Jesus, our time that we use should be vastly different than how we used our lives before we came to salvation in Jesus Christ. Listen to what this says. Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, Jesus' new life in you should change you. I guess what I'm saying is that your calendar should be redeemed shortly after your soul is redeemed. Your calendar should look completely different. Your motives should be different. Your purpose in life should be different. Your goals should be different. Your thought patterns should be different. The time should be redeemed for the glory of God. Shortly after. I mean, why else would you <clears throat> go to a neighbor's house and rake leaves because they're older than you? Why would you take the time to do that? Why would you take the time to call a single mom and say, hey, I'll watch the kids. You can go to the store or go get your nails done or whatever else. Why would you stop on the side of the road and help someone change a flat tire? Why would you volunteer somewhere that's out of your own wheelhouse or your comfort zone? Why would you do any of those things if it wasn't that Jesus made a difference in your life and that you want to do something because Jesus made a difference in your life and you want to live into that new life because you're grateful for it, you love it, and that brings out the key idea. Key idea is this. I offer my time, but that's not it. I offer my time to fulfill God's purpose. See, here's what happened. When Jesus hung on that cross for you and for me, it was all about us. He set aside every part of him, and it became all about ministering to you and me, bringing us into the kingdom of God. And so when we become a Christian, we accept that sacrifice that should step us out of the self-centered, selfish, do what I want, when and when I want mode, and it should step me into this gratitude mode with the living God of the universe who saved me. And he wants me to engage my life in the lives of other people that he deeply cares about. That's what he puts us on this earth for. And so what I begin to believe is it's not my time, it's Jesus' time. It's not my job, it's Jesus' job. 
He's going to help me become the person he wants me to be and work through me in the ways that he wants to work through me. Now, here's the thing about this. I offer my time to the fulfillment of God's purposes. We have to be certain that we're committed to the second half of that as much as the first half. In other words, I can offer my time to anything. But to offer my time to fulfilling God's purposes, holy smokes, that's exactly what Colossians 3.17 is telling us to do. Here's, here, so you go to court. You've done something wrong. And the judge sentences you to community service, right? So you have to go out and what are you doing? You're offering your time, right? You're giving your time away, right? But you're not giving your time to the glory of God nearly as much as you're giving it to what? Get out of your sentence. Finish your sentence so you can get on with your life, right? Well, our lives should be so grat grateful to God for what he's done for us because of this response that I have in my life because of God's great grace and God's great love and God's great power and God's great gracefulness in my life. Here's what you need to hear. You shouldn't need a law to tell you to serve Jesus Christ. It should come naturally out of gratitude for what he's done for you. See, here's the thing. We live dead lives as Christians. We live lives that make no difference in the eternal kingdom of God. And then somehow we think that's okay for me to just do what I want and when I want. And, well, Jesus will bless it. Jesus blessed that. It's ludicrous to think that. It should come from a heart of gratitude where I say, Jesus, where do you want to use me in the world and how do you want to use me? I'll step into that. I want to step into that. I don't want to be, do something for myself. As a matter of fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, so got this. What I love about Paul is he amped everything up. When he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he went away for three years to figure out what that meant. When he was serving in ministry, he gave his all to ministry to the point of death. And you know how he described this thing of offering my time to God to fulfill God's purposes? Listen to this. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I love that. The life I now live in the body, this, isn't, this is real life to him. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Holy smokes. He says, I'm going to live my life, and I don't care what the world says. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care about anything except for stepping into the ministry that Jesus wants me to have. That's why he could look at a bunch of Roman soldiers and say, call your boss because you arrested a Roman soldier. And then at the same time, he could go to people in, in, in uh, Greece and he could say, I want to tell you about the unknown God that you guys love. And everything in between, because he took his chronos life, he took his day-to-day, moment-by-moment, wherever he was in time life, and he created kairos moments. He created those moments where he let the Spirit of God fill him. And then he let the Spirit of God take control and use him the way he needed to be used. And he recognized that what that means is, I need to be dead to me. I'm dead. The life I live in the body, man, it's for Jesus Christ. It's no longer for me. What an incredible statement. I think that should be all of our life goal, is to live our life for him that way. And so if I believe this, if I truly believe that God wants to use me as a vessel to the world, and he wants me to use my time to fulfill his purposes, then what's the application in my life? What difference does it make or should it make in even the way I live? Well, I want to give you four ways today. Very simply, four ways that you can do it. And then we'll talk over a little insert I gave. But these are the four ways that I think you could use your time for the glory of God. And the first one is this. Prayer or connecting to God's presence. You know, Jesus had a way different sense of time than you and I did, didn't he? You know, those disciples asked him, okay, Jesus, they asked him a question. You know what he'd say? It's not my time. It's not my Kairos moment yet. They'd ask him a question and he'd say, it's not for you to know the time. 
So Jesus is walking along with these disciples for three years, chronological, chronos time, and they're asking him these questions, and he's saying, eh, not, not the right time. It's not the opportune time. I want you to note something. Jesus did not die on that cross one second sooner than he should have or one second later than he should have. He knew the opportune time when the time was right, the Bible says. Oh, what a lesson for you and me. The spirit of Jesus lives in us, and as we walk our chronos day-to-day, moment-by-moment time, there are all of these kairos moments God wants to give you. The aha moments of life. The hearing God's voice speak to you moments of life to fulfill God's purpose in your life. That's what prayer is all about. And Jesus did this his whole life. I mean, even when he was a young kid, he took kairos moments. He goes to Jerusalem with his family when he's a kid, 12 years old. And mom and dad go to this festival, and then they leave the festival, and they're driving home in their little car, and then they realize, oh, Jesus isn't in the back seat. (laughs) And so they turn around, and they drive, and they get back, and Jesus is where? He's in the temple. He's in the temple. Listen to what Jesus says about this. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Listen to them. But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and he was obedient to them. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and favor with man. Jesus is our model. Do you want to know how to to grow in stature and wisdom and favor with God and favor with man? You let Jesus bring you into Kairos moments. Because as, as the day is long, I will guarantee you, if you do not have Kairos moments, you don't have an ounce of gratitude toward Jesus. You can ex- have accepted his, his um, sacrifice for you on that cross. You can say yes to him. You can go through communion every month. You can talk to people. You can even be in a ministry. But if you don't step into that relationship, you don't have an ounce of gratitude. It's because your heart can't connect what your mind thinks about something. In Jesus, I call it opening up that valve from your head to your heart. If it's not there, that's the complete person. It's not just your head, it's your head and your heart. I hate it when churches say, it has to be all about up here, and I hate it when churches say it has to be all about right here. Because both are necessary to live a complete Christian life. That's just how it is. And so Jesus got this and he understood this. So I guess the question is, when do we spend time in God's house or in God's presence? There's a broader category to prayer because prayer really is two things. There's both sides. There's set times that we pray. You're here today. You're in a Kairos moment. It's a set time that you came to be set apart to just hear what God has to say to you. A Kairos moment. But then there are also these myriads of time that Jesus doesn't want to just give you an hour on a Sunday morning. He wants your life to be this. He wants your chronos time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, to be lived with him. He doesn't want you to be separated from him. He wants you to live your whole life living into this principle that God is with me at every moment of every day. It's an awareness of God's presence in our lives. It's intentionally connecting to God every moment of every day. It's when I am going to a meeting and I just have to say, Jesus, can you help me to know what to say during this meeting? It's those moments with my family that I bow and pray to thank God for the meal. I don't do that because it's an exercise. I do it because Jesus is with us at the table. So we might as well thank him like my kids would thank me for getting them a present. It's the moments when I, when I, 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 I do this with people a lot. I do one minute prayers. So what I'll do is I'll set my alarm and I'll ask somebody, do we really need to pray about this? Can you take one minute at one in the afternoon or whatever time it is 
And let's just covenant with each other to pray about this for the next month. And I set my alarm. I literally set my alarm to do that. Elma and I, when we get in the car, we always pray through things. Our prayer list is so long that if we just sat down to pray, it would take us seven hours. But what we can do is we can have that prayer list with us. And as I'm driving in the car, I can't tell you the number of radio fasts I do. Try it someday. See what happens. Do a radio fast and use that time to pray when you're in your car. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. It creates a Kairos moment. When you're living your Kronos day-by-day time frame and all you do is let stuff come in your ears all the time or come in your eyes all the time, those Kairos moments just aren't going to be there. But when you take that time to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. So there's those times like today, and then there's those every other time in your life that you're able to do that. Then there's a second category that we can spend our time in, and that's relationships or loving others. The great commandment, Jesus says to love God, which is prayer, what we're talking about. But then he says to love your neighbor as yourself. And these first two categories, loving God and loving other people, that sets a priority in my life. That God's going to use my spiritual gift set and he's going to use my time for his glory through helping other people. And you need to hear me. You need to hear me on this. Your time with other people begins with your family. Did you hear me? Your time with other people begins with your family. You can pick your friends. You can pick your nose. You can't pick your friend's nose. But you can pick relationships in life. But Jesus gives you your family relationships. And he says, they are my number one priority for you in this life. Timothy was a pastor and Paul was his mentor. And Paul writes to Timothy, and here's what he says about this whole thing. He's he's talking about a person entering into ministry, and he says, He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. And then in his little quotations, I love that. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? This should apply to everybody. This is a scripture that should apply to all of us. I mean, if we don't take care of our families, how are we going to take care of anything else? If, we, if things aren't right at home, how are they going to be right the rest of our lives? I mean, you know my story. I'm talking from personal experience. This is a heartbeat for me because I worked as a workaholic and it hurt my family. And I had to learn this. I had to learn. So listen to someone who had to learn from experience. I'll give you just one example. I'm an apprentice, an electrical apprentice. I'm working at Elitch Gardens. We're building a, it was a ride called the Gold Fever. It was at old Elitch Gardens on 38th and Tennyson. It had to be open by July 4th, and I was working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And I would come home. And I would go into my kids' rooms, and I'd kiss them on the forehead. Two days before we were finished with that, my daughter wakes up when I'm kissing her. She was maybe eight, seven, eight. And she opens her eyes and she looks at me and she rubs her eyes and she says, Daddy, when are you going to move home? And it tore my heart out. Because I was at home. But I just wasn't available to my children. I heard a story once, and it's always stuck with me. Uh, Father comes home. He'd been working long hours, kind of like I had. And he comes home, and his son says to him, says, Dad, how much do you make an hour? And his dad says, well, why would you ask that question? He says, well, I just, I need to know. How much do you make an hour? He says, I make $20 an hour. So the kid says, can I borrow $10? And the dad gets mad and says, look, I've just been working all these hours. I don't work all these hours just to give you money for nothing. He said, no, you can't have $10. And so he sends the kid to bed. And so he goes to bed. And, and then the dad later realizes that he shouldn't have done that. And he goes in the room and he says, son, here's $10. Why do you want the $10? And the kid's just excited. He's all excited. And, and he reaches under his pillow and he pulls out more money. 
And then he gets a little mad. He's like, well, you've already got money. Why do you need $10 more? And so he gets all this money and he counts it out. He says, the reason I needed the money, Dad, is I didn't have enough. Now I've got $20. Can I buy an hour of your time? And it doesn't necessarily need to be away from home. You can be present in your family's lives and be a million miles away. Kids aren't stupid, they know it. When they become second to us, when we have, it's more important that I watch the Bronco game or it's more important that I go to my bowling league or it's more important that I uh, have three or four beers before I can unwind. When I used to come home when my kids were little, I honestly used to do this. I realized that when I came in the door all amped up, I just wasn't available to my kids. So what I learned to do is before I'd be in my van, I'd pull up to the house, and I'd write down all of the issues of the day. Sometimes it was one big, huge issue. Sometimes it was five issues. And I would take those, and I would open up. We, we got milk delivered at home. And I would open up the milk box, and I'd drop it in the milk box. And I would say, Lord, those problems have been thrown into the trash for today. And I'd go in. And when you're little kids, you see mom or you see dad, and you just jump on them. And I'd let them do that. But until I did that, I carried everything with me. I carried every stress, every issue with me. This is essential that you understand that your family is number one. Because here's what happens. When I realize that and I begin to live into that, and I begin to thank God for the value of having a family around me, then I'm able to let that expand and let Jesus use me in other areas besides just my family. And more than that, he uses my family and people looking in at my family and saying, wow, look at that. I'm impressed by that. And you know what? When I begin to do that, um, this scripture is lived out. And I want you to know the scripture I'm going to read to you is the scripture for this church for this year. And it comes from Galatians 6. And let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Holy smokes. Then it goes on. Therefore, as you have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of God. Oh, man. And doing good, you know what that means? Giving time to other people. Giving them the, the time and respect and consideration to be able to listen to them. See, my relationship with God begins to produce relationships in my family and that begins to spread out to produce relationships in a world that Christ wants me to reach people for. So how am I intentionally giving up my time in relationships that God called me to give my relationships to? And this is essential to understand in your workplace. God is calling you to nurture people. Tom Dwyer, the guy I was the apprentice with, when I began to realize my work problems and tendencies, I went to him. And I said to him, Tom, I can't work overtime anymore. I can't work Saturdays anymore. And he said, then you may not have a job. And I said, then I don't have a job. But I need to spend that time with my kids. And about six months later, he never fired me. About six months later, he came to me and says, you know what? I have never seen a person stand up for their family like that. And he said, I have huge amounts of props and respect for that. He had never been married. I don't know that he understood the importance of family relationships. But I was, I was actually a help in his life, simply by taking a stance and saying, my family's more important than my do how much I make per hour. And here's what God wants us to do. He wants us to live in relationships within the family of God and then he wants us to expand that and live in relationships with people who don't know him yet. It's not one or the other, it's all of them. And everything in between. So, have you ever thought of going golfing with friends or going bowling with people or going out to lunch with somebody is actually unto the Lord? But you're doing it as if you're doing it for God? If you let your chronos time 
your chronological time, allow God to produce kairos moments in those, then you'll get that. Then you'll understand that. There are people around you screaming to know that they're cared for. But then there's a third one. A third way we can use our time is by work or contributing our efforts. I love the book of Haggai. And in the very first chapter, he gives like this prophetic word to the children of Israel that's how to contribute their efforts to the work of God versus their own lives. Uh, This is beginning at verse 8. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Then listen to what he says. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Oh, why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, which each of, while each of you is busy with his own house. There's a distinction made here between what I give to God and what I use for myself. And he's telling the children of Israel, time out, look at your life, look what you're doing. My house is in ruins and you're spending all your time and money on your house, on what you want. And he says, you expected a lot from me and you're not getting it. Why aren't you getting it? Because I want you to bring glory to me first. I want you to use your time. I want you to use your money to bring glory to me. Fulfill my purposes. Then, as it says in Matthew chapter 6, 33, then all these things will be added to you. It's a matter of focus. And he's telling these children of Israel, you just aren't getting it. And he had to be kind of harsh with them. And he makes this distinction. So what contribution or time are you using to build up the kingdom of God? What contribution of your time are you utilizing to help God bring glory to his name through you? Because I truly believe God gives us spiritual gifts. Actually, he gives us more than that. He gives us our spiritual gifts. He gives us our heart passions. He gives us our abilities and talents. He gives us our personality, unless you don't have one like me, but he gives us our personality and he gives us our experiences. He gives us these as gifts. He hand wraps them, handmade for you and me, and he gives them to us so we can utilize them for the kingdom of God. And your work is just one example, like your work work or your school. If you're a student, Those are handpicked by God to utilize for his glory, for his kingdom. You know, um, in 2002, I crashed and burned. And I went to work for an electrical contractor before I got to this church. And this electrical contractor, I worked with him for seven years. And I had actually worked with him before I crashed and burned. But I worked with him for seven years. Wonderful man of God. He taught me how to forgive people. He taught me how to love people. He was a great man. And many of you know he died in May. And he came to me just before he died and he said, Larry, he said, "Uh, I'm not going to be here much longer and when I die, there's no one to hold the master's license for my business. And he said, my son can get a master's license, but it's going to take him a little while to do that. And I really couldn't trust anybody with my family other than you. Would you be willing to hold the master license for my business until my son can get his? So I said, yeah. So what I do is every Wednesday, I go at 7 in the morning, I go to Chris Electric, and I work there until noon. And then the time I spend there, I work on Saturdays at my house now for the church. And I'll tell you what it's done for me. First thing it did is it's allowed me to give back to a family where this man poured into me for years when I was broken. And it's been amazing. The other thing it's done for me is I was always a church planter. So I was around non-Christians 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I fell in love with non-Christians. And I won't say I don't love you guys, but sometimes I'm at church and I don't see a non-Christian for like a week at a time. And I need to schedule opportunities to meet non-Christians. I mean, I want to be an example to you. If we, if we want to fill this church with people who need to know Jesus, I want to be an example to that. And God opened up this door, and I'm sitting in dispatch with these electricians, and they're throwing the F-bomb, and then they realize there's a pastor in the room. <gasps> I mean, 
mean, I just think it's hilarious. Like, I've never heard that before. So, you know, but it's amazing to be around these non-Christians. So, so I'm able to talk to them. And not only am I able to lay them out, here's what you need to do on this job. Here's how you need to talk to this contractor. Here's what you need to do here. I'm also able to say, let's pray before you guys go. It's awesome. Totally awesome. And it's supported by the people that own the business. So it's great. And God has the same thing for you. God wants you to stand up for justice. He wants you to provide a safe place for people to be able to decompress. He wants you to speak honestly about things that are going on at school or at the office. He wants you to give a word of encouragement to help someone that's just down and out. He wants you to be a trusted friend to people who have no friends and maybe don't even think they could ever have a friend. He wants you to have a passion for making people's lives in relationship to be better than they were before you. So how do you spend your time and your efforts at work for the Lord? How do you do that? Where are your opportunities to volunteer outside of your own experience in life? You know, last week we did sign-ups for uh, ministries within the church. And I thank you for the people who signed up. And we had a lot of people say that they wanted, they wanted those those opportunities to be up more than just one week. And so at the resource center, at the hospitality counter, um, there's, there's a list of those things still with a little explanation of what they are. And if you want to sign up, you can look at it today or peruse them over the next few weeks because they'll be up there. So we wanted to honor that for people who wanted to pray about what they wanted to be in first. But once again, we've got a whole couple of tables full of information now, what's the difference between those and the ones that we did last week? Last week, there were opportunities to serve in the church. We truly believe, we truly believe with our whole heart and soul that we need to do a ministry within the church because it helps the church to be healthy, growing, a vital organism that helps reach our community. But we don't want to stop by just doing things within the church. We want to do things in the world around us and the community around us. That's what all of those ministries represent that are over there. There are ministries outside the church. I do whiz kids. I mean, you, I am not a teacher, and I am especially not a teacher of young kids, but I do whiz kids because I want to be an example to you. I want to step out of my comfort zone and do something that I know I wouldn't normally do because I want you to understand how seriously I take this. That's one of the ministries. We have got the ministry of the Homeless Shelter Initiative where they need volunteers to go to Applewood, uh, one, I think it's like three or four times a year for one week periods. They may not even call you that week. It's only if it gets to be a certain temperature. And you go there and you help them out. We've got the Hope Academy for girls coming out of the sex slave industry. We've got all kinds of ministries like that. And then we've got a couple of ministries that are kind of weird because they're on, on the campus, but they're actually outreach ministries. So as an example, we've got our Grace's Groceries. There's information on that, that you can sign up for a ministry with Grace's Groceries, and it reaches literally 90% of the people that come, come from the community into us. They've heard about us. Um, and then my heart beats for the Harvest Festival. We usually do a picnic. I really felt the Lord was telling us we shouldn't do a picnic this year. We need to pour all of our resources into a Harvest Festival. And I believe God told me that he wants to fill that parking lot with 60 cars that are trunk or treat cars so the kids could come engage in one place. And you know what that creates? That creates all kinds of opportunities. One for you to serve here in an outreach event. Another for you to serve here in an outreach event that only take you a couple hours. Another one that you're able then to ask people and invite people that don't come to this church to come for the Harvest Festival. To be able to engage them in a new way that maybe you've never engaged them before. It allows you to step out of your Kronos time enough to let God give you a Kairos moment to ask him, what can I even say to this person? How can I invite them? Do you see the opportunities that it creates just a willingness to, as you live your day-to-day -day life, allow God to take that day-to-day -day life and use it to fulfill his purposes. So that's three. And the fourth one is every bit as important as the other three, and that is rest. 
In other words, stepping into, uh, step, stopping to delight in the Lord. Time was so important to God that he wrote about it right at the very beginning of the whole Bible. And it says that he took six days to create the world. And then he took a seventh day. And what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. And God rested and he wants you and me to be able to rest as well. And I'm going to tell you something. It takes a lot of faith to just stop and to trust that God's still at work. I somehow sometimes think that if I don't do something for God, somehow God isn't going to get it done. I got some news for you. If you don't share with your neighbor how much Jesus loves them, Jesus doesn't say, oh, well, I guess they'll never hear. He gives them another opportunity to hear, but you've lost that opportunity. You've lost a Kairos moment in your life. But when you say, Jesus, what do you want me to live into? He'll do it. And then there are those times that he says, I need you to step back. I need you to be able to rest. I need you to be able to not do something. And it takes faith to do that. Moses, with the children of Israel, he was given this command by God and he gives it to the children of Israel. Moses said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil and save whatever is left and keep it until the morning. Listen, they say time is money. You ever heard that saying? Time is money. But you know what else time is? It's a time, an opportunity for you to be able to rest. Look at the price we pay for not taking a Sabbath in our lives. You know, they have done studies and they have proven, I don't know if any of you works and does um, a graveyard shift. And God bless you and I love you and I know some people absolutely love graveyard shift. But the person who works a graveyard shift average in their adult life lives average seven years less than a person who doesn't. Why is that? Because God gave us a clock. He gave us these rhythms of life and we just go beyond these rhythms of life. You want to know another statistic? 30%, one in three people in America is on some sort of a medication for anxiety. One in three people. It's because the rhythms of our life are disrupted. That we're not taking the time to decompress, to listen to God. We live our chronos lives, and then we're so chronos that we just try to fill the void with whatever we can fill the void with, rather than stepping back and doing what God said that he knew when he created the world. And that's just take a minute, take a time out, and rest. And I think it's tragic. Once again, speaking from experience. These are things you can learn from your pastor. Because I did crash and burn. I was in counseling for three years after I crashed and burned. I sat in the back row of this church for two years of that while I was getting better. And it took a long time for me to regain energy. Because once you crash and burn, it's not just that you can take a week off and then you're better all of a sudden. It takes time. It's because of the rhythms of life. And I realized that it does take faith to understand that God works. And and so, I guess the Sabbath can mean 24 hours, but I think it's also taking a time out in our day to disconnect. Have you ever thought of disconnecting from technology? You want to know another statistic? Do you know how many times a day the average person checks their phone? A hundred and fifty. 150 times. Now, next time that you're just sitting there and you just want to click and see if I get a message. You ever done that? Just click and I'm sitting there. Well, I texted someone a while ago and I haven't texted back. So you, you just click that phone. That's one time. And five minutes later, I still haven't heard. You click it again. Doesn't matter if you did anything on it or not. You're hooked to that because you're waiting for that. Just saying, did anything come through? Facebook, did anything on Facebook come through? Any, did anything on Instagram come through? Anything on Twitter come through? And you're constantly checking it. 150 times. That shocked me when I read that. But I started thinking about myself, and you know what? I'm not really a tech person, and I probably do it 
well over 100 times a day. It's just the rhythm of life. So maybe you need to disconnect to be able to do that. Or maybe you need to disconnect from your efforts. Maybe you've got to say, God, I've got to step back from the things I'm doing for you because I just need to be with you. I just need to take this moment to cherish and relish the fact that I live in life with you. Because isn't that the goal and the motive of everything we should do? We should stop, reflect on the love of God, the faithfulness of God, the provision of God, the protection of God, God's peace that he brings into our lives, the power that God has given me to overcome things that has overcome, his provision and protection of me, the times he's protected my family, that they literally could have fallen apart. And he said, no, I'm not going to let that happen. Those are the times for me to be able to do this. And these rules of life, these four things, these four simple, simple things that I can spend my time in prayer with God. I can spend my time in relationship with other people. I can spend my time letting God use the work and the work abilities that he's given me for the glory and the kingdom of God. And I can spend my time resting. These are the rhythms of life, the rules of life that can create in you a whole new way of looking at things. You can be fulfilled in life, but you'll never know that. And I'm going to guarantee you, I don't know what you do with any of these four things from Adam. I do not know. Here's what I know. If you don't spend time doing those four things, you're missing out on what God has for you. Every one of those. If you don't spend time in prayer with God, you're missing God's best for your life. If you're not spending time in relationship with other people, you're missing God's best for your life. If you're not spending time letting God use your gift set to build into the purposes of the kingdom, then you're not fulfilled in your life. And if you don't rest, then guess what? You're not being fulfilled in life. And somehow we take each of these and we helter-skelter try to meet one of them when God says, I want a whole fully rounded life. So here's what I'd like you to do. There's a little insert in your worship guide. And there is space in each one of these squares. And I would ask you to consider this. I would ask you to take some of your chronos time this week. Some of your 24 hours a day during the next seven days of this week, 168 hours. I would ask, 168 hours times seven. I would ask you to do this. Take a little bit of that time and look at this. And ask God to create during that Kronos time Kairos moments. And I want you to look at this and I want to say, okay, Lord, with prayer, how, how am I doing in prayer? You know, what, what are the good things that are going on in prayer? Lord, what are some of the challenging things that are going on in prayer? And God, what do I need to do? What do I need to adjust, take away, or put add in order for this to really become a strength in my life? That's the three questions you just need to ask with any or all four of these. God, how am I doing in resting? What are the good parts of it? What are the positive things that I'm doing in terms of resting? What are the things I'm not doing so good in resting? And what do I need to adjust in order to rest better? And the same with relationships or work. And I got to tell you, this is more in time management. This is offering my time to God to use for his purposes in my life, to use for his glory. Because I will tell you, he does not want some of my time. God wants all of it. He wants every part of you. He doesn't want you taking vacations. And he wants it to be used wisely for the glory of God and for his kingdom. He wants people to come to faith in Christ. He wants people to grow in Christ. He wants people to be encouraged in Christ. We can only do that if we begin to live out these four things in our own lives. Can we bow our heads in prayer? I guess if there's anything I could say, it's the truth that God's own name reflects his desire to be with us. Moses asked him, what is, my, what is your name? And he said, I am that I am, and I will be with you wherever you go. Isaiah named Jesus Emmanuel, meaning God with us.
And just as Jesus entered space and time to engage in these four areas of his life to fulfill God's purposes, I think Jesus wants us to enter space and time and be Jesus to the world around us. Lord Jesus, on behalf of every person here today, I know that every one of us needs to work on at least one of these four elements of our time in offering you our time. So I guess what I'm saying is on behalf of this congregation, I offer each person to you. I offer our entire lives to you and I ask you to bring glory to the kingdom of God and fulfill the purposes of every person here. Alter our time the way we need to alter it, Lord, to make it more meaningful and productive for you. In Jesus' name, amen.